Good afternoon. I'm Gracie Branch, and I will be the moderator for today's session, Partner with Families. This is, a, this is the third installment in our four-part webinar series, School Community Partnerships for the Whole Child. You can go to the next slide. I currently serve as the Associate Executive Director for Professional Learning at the National Association of Elementary School Principals, better known as NAESP. And our mission is to lead in the advocacy and support for elementary and middle level principals, pre-K through eighth grade. At NAESP, we have done extended work in the realm of early childhood. I'm very excited to be a part of the webinar today and I'm even more pleased to announce that we will have a new publication coming out this January entitled Leading Learning Communities, a Principal's Guide to Early Learning and the Early Grades Pre-K through Third Grade. Now we'd also like to find out a little bit about our participants today and who you are and what you do. So would you please feel free to introduce yourself using the chat box feature Make sure you put your name, where you're from, and the role that you have. Also, we'd like to encourage you tweeters out there to tweet out today using our hashtag ECE whole child. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce our esteemed panelists for today. Next slide. Mm -hmm. I wanna give them an opportunity to tell you about the organizations that they represent before we jump into today's hot topics for discussion. First, I would like to introduce Manny Sibana, who is a program specialist at Sun Service System. Manny, please tell us a little bit about your organization and your role there. Hey everyone, I'm happy to be here. My name is, uh, yes, Manny, and I am a program specialist for Multnomah County in Portland, Oregon for the Youth and Family Services Division. Um, so over there, I oversee three programs. The first one is Early Kindergarten Transition Programs, the Parent Teacher Home Visiting Program, and of course, our P3 program, which stands for prenatal to third grade. And over 20 some years of serving, you know, youth and family directly out in the community, um, working in different environments, capacities and settings has, has led me um, here to the county. And before I came to the county, I worked for many years um, for ERCO, which stands for Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization. So I'm really happy to hear, be here and for Folks that don't know what SUN stands for, SUN stands for Schools Uniting Neighborhoods, and I will share a little bit more about that, that system. So thank you. Thank you, Manny. And our next panelist is B.B. Otero. B.B. is president of the Otero Strategy Group. So B.B., tell us a little bit about your group. So uh, Otero Strategy Group is a consulting uh, practice. We work um, primarily on policy issues related to early care and education, health and human services, and um, uh, immigrant issues. And so um, we've been providing um, supports to local, local jurisdictions, uh, policymakers, as well as advocacy groups. Um, I've got, I have a long history of, the, of first running for about 20 years a nonprofit organization that included child care and family support services in the immigrant community in Washington, DC. Um, I currently also serve as an advisor to um, a special assistant to the county executive in Montgomery County, Maryland, um, and um, have been um, involved in a lot of the advocacy work around uh, in the birth to three, as well as the universal pre-K in, in Washington, DC. And I'm formerly the deputy mayor of Health and Human Services for Washington. Thank you. And next, we can go to the next slide as well. We have Minerva Pardo. Minerva is the Family Engagement Coordinator for the West Valley School District. Minerva, tell us a little bit about your position. Uh, well, my position uh, as it says, family engagement, I work with uh, mainly Hispanic population, but uh, under my radar, I do so many different things uh, such as uh, 
ELL classes for parents or weekly meetings for English speaking families as well as Spanish speaking families. I build a lot of uh, community engagement, and I am also the leader on an initiative called Stronger Together, Más Fuertes Juntos, which main uh, goal is to remove systemic barriers. I'm a strong advocate for anti-racist practices. Thank you, Minerva. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Joe Bondahar. Joe is the principal at Sandoz Elementary in Omaha, Nebraska. Joe, will you please share about your role as principal for Millard Public Schools? Absolutely, excited to be here. Um, and along with all the other panelists, I am. I'm at Sandoz Elementary, which is in Omaha, Nebraska. We're part of the Millard uh, Public School System, which is just outside of Omaha. It's a suburban district with about 25,000 kids um, in our district in total. Uh, we're very fortunate at Sandoz to be part of our uh, superintendent's early childhood plan and partner with the Buffett Early Childhood Institute uh, to implement school as a hub. And I'm in my second year as principal here at Sandoz. Uh, and the school of Sandoz, we serve about 400 kids birth through grade five. And so um, really our commitment is serving not only uh, the children in our school, but all the way at birth as well as supporting their families. And it's been a really uh, excellent partnership and excited to kind of share a little bit about that with you today. So today we'll be framing our discussion around the topic of developing and fostering partnerships with families and the communities in which they live. And all of our panelists, we are so lucky to have them here today because they have a lot of experience with this we also realize the importance of this because of a child's education, it doesn't just begin and end at the school door. We consider families and their communities as essential partners in the important task of promoting the physical, cognitive, and social emo emotional health and growth of our children. So we are looking at the whole child. Now we also wanna to acknowledge today that we realize that we are all living in a heightened state of alert and anxiety, that there has been nothing very normal about our world right now. So today, as we focus on the ways that we meet the needs and engage intentionally with families, especially those who have been traditionally marginalized we want you to know that we are keeping your current reality in mind. So let's go to the next slide. And this leads us to our first question for all of our panelists. Can each of you give a brief overview of the needs of culturally specific groups that you serve and how your organization is currently meeting these needs? And Manny, why don't we start with you? Absolutely. So in terms of our culturally specific needs and our immigrant and refugee community needs, they absolutely need um, support with navigating systems, you name it, all the systems, school system, healthcare systems, transportation, um, all, all the systems that you can think of. They just need that support and accessing these resources from, you know, finding where to get extra food and supplies, learning about how even banks work, how to get around in their community with transportation. If they don't drive, they just need all, all that extra support um, there. And not only just that, but because um, these specific groups are very new to family engagement and family engagement activities, just that concept, we absolutely need to be able to provide materials and supplies to these families to have at home so they can support and engage with their children pre-COVID and during COVID um, with these early learning activities that we're all providing in home. I mean, things from crayons and glue and you name it, all that, all those fun things. And most important, they, they need a person. They need a person. They need a person that can be a liaison, an advocate, a, a bridge, a connector, someone that can 
um, represent them, someone that can, can communicate with them well, someone who engages in the community and understands and is aware of their community needs. They just need that person because that person is needed to help build relationships and trust with um, those culturally specific communities. Very important. The, uh, the communities also need a space um, and time for, you know, for especially for the parents to be able to, to gather in a group setting, to connect, to be able to engage in authentic, intimate um, conversations on topics and issues that are really relevant and important to them and most important for them to be able to talk to each other in their specific, in their specific language. And, um, and within um, these group settings, it, it's all about helping them build strong families, right? And supporting each other. And in Multnomah County, P3, the program P3, prenatal to third grade does that by um, the facilitators and the coordinators hosting parent cafes. And that's how we do it, very culture specific cafes. Yes. And um, one thing that's really connected to that is our families need meals. You know, food brings people together, um, snacks during a session or a playing learn group. They do. They need meals. It's a way for us to show them that we care and are taking care of our community members. But it's also a way for them to come together and connect and share, you know, these memories together through food. Um, another thing that I can think of that our um, family needs is the opportunity, the opportunity to actually come into a school environment early on, way before their children is registered in their um, school community, an opportunity for them to participate in a play and learn group that is free, that is open to families with children ages zero to five to give them the opportunity to connect with one another, but most important, an opportunity for them to feel a sense of belonging. Um, absolutely really important. And then to build that trust and relationship with their school community early on and getting to know their community and also understanding that their school community, their school is a hub for them to go to for resources and connections. So yeah, and here in Multnomah County, we're able to do that because we have six years ago started a P3 pilot program with our early learning Multnomah hub to start this. And P3 was a program that is under the umbrella of our Sun service system, Schools Uniting Neighborhoods. This is a system that has been in place at Multnomah County for about 20 years now. And what it is, it's a school-based extended day enrichment program for youth and families. We have about 90 schools within our six districts. And currently we have 10 P3 coordinators, one at least based in all the districts um, to provide all those the needs that I'm talking about. And um, P3s um, are there with along with SUN and working alongside the SUN program. And with the, um, the SUN program, the county contracts out to about six different culturally specific and responsive community organization agencies to provide these services. And with that, these folks, the staff, they really reflect the community, the communities that they serve. To, uh, to the T from language, if not language, definitely an awareness and a need of the communities that they serve. And that's how we're able to do that. And we're going on six years with P3. So really excited. Hopefully we expand. Thank you. And you mentioned hub. And when I heard that word, I was thinking about you, Joe, and what you're doing at Sandoz Elementary. So why don't you take up, answer that, answer that question that we just talked about? Absolutely. Yeah, I was picking up on that too. I um, jotted a few things down as well. Um, yeah, so we are as part of our, we really work to be a school as a hub. And so um, to me, what that means in our team is that we're identifying ways that our school, Sandoz, really belongs to everyone in the community, that it's not our, um, or our family's job to um, transition or change to what we do, but really us to adapt to their needs. And so, um, as I mentioned before, I'm in year two here, and the important point that our uh, team has really worked on so far is just 
how are we getting feedback from our community? And so we've been really invested in hearing uh, from the culturally specific groups um, that attend our school. Uh, what we've kind of found is that oftentimes there's, um, there's concerns, but they're not bringing them to our, um, to our teams. And so what that kind of tells us is we're not asking the right questions. We're not asking in the right way. We're not doing it in a way that's comfortable um, and welcoming. And so that just has led to a lot of reflection uh, for us. So one of the things this year that I've been really committed to is redesigning any of the um, groups that I meet with, uh, parent groups, to make sure those groups are reflective um, of our student population. Um, so as uh, Manny mentioned, that they, they have somebody um, that has influence that they can go to, that they feel comfortable with, um, and it helps me develop relationships um, and understand the different perspectives that um, we have within our building. And that's been a huge, uh, a huge thing. We're just beginning with that, but it's been a really important, really important step that we've taken. I think beyond that, um, we just are trying to be more open, welcoming feedback in informal and formal ways. One thing that Sandoz has done um, pre-COVID was we do uh, coffee and donuts on Friday mornings. We just kind of open up our foyer um, and we allow families to come in. Very simple idea, but I think some of our best school improvement initiatives come from those conversations that happen um, over coffee and juice uh, and donuts in the morning. And so we're really missing that right now. We've tried to replicate it a little bit with some drop-in Zooms and things like that, um, but we're excited to hopefully eventually get back to that. I think what that um, speaks to is we're just trying to trying to be um, there to listen and make sure they know we're there um, to support them and you know adapt to whatever needs they have. During COVID, um, we've just like everybody, we've been trying to be as nimble um, as we possibly can, making sure uh, material pickups and deliveries are happening, making sure we're getting books um, to families if they don't have those books, making sure we're providing um, activities and ideas, not just saying, hey, keep your kids reading, um, but actually ideas that come along with that. Um, and, you know, I think um, there's been a lot of hard things about um, this path that we've been on now for a while, but in some ways, I think it really has opened up our school building to our community in a much different way than we would have probably ever done before. And it's allowed our families to get a good glimpse of what happens each and every day. Um, and they're able to be a little more active and ask very specific questions and develop relationships with teachers uh, in just new ways. And so that's been really exciting to see some of our families who maybe weren't engaged um, prior to this become engaged through this new opportunity, this new experience. Um, so yeah, lots of great things. Like I said, just kind of constantly trying to be nimble and keep up with the ever-changing world that we live in right now. Great. Phoebe, what would you like to add? So I would um, sort of echo Ellen and, and um, ditto everything that uh, Joe and Manny have said in terms of um, uh, certainly the years that I spent uh, running community-based programs um, in the metropolitan area here in Washington. Um, the very many, the very same things that Joe and Manny said were things that we really try to incorporate into our programs and make sure that uh, we have lots of parent-led kinds of, of, of programming, uh, that parents were able to design their own programs, um, that they, they were really not just the recipients, but also the executors, the designers, and in many cases, um, providing that opportunity for parents to culturally um, to become more culturally uh, connected in, in, in their new, and for many of the families we worked with, uh, recent immigrant families um, or first generation. And so I think the, the things that were, that were highlighted by the two speakers were really, really, really important. I really like Manny's point about navigating systems. That is absolutely one of the, the, the most, I think the primary pieces in terms of the work that we do around parent engagement. Um, much of my focus has been community-based childcare uh, and, and how, how community-based childcare supports families and works with families. As I moved into the policy work, I really became much more, um, 
I, I brought the experience of on the ground work and 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 work that uh, that I did as a as a on a community based setting. And the and and COVID has even highlighted some of those even more. So the kinds of policy work that we're doing is one really helping um, folks understand public charge and understand. Uh, the fear that many of our communities and our immigrant communities have around what's public charge. And for those of you who may not know what that is, public charge is a federal regulation that basically um, does not allow many of our uh, families that are either uh, mixed status or undocumented to receive uh, public services such as food stamps and, and um, uh, TANF and others. But there, it has created such a level of fear in our communities that parents aren't accessing things that they should be able to access regardless of their status. Um, and so that's a, been a very important piece, an, an education piece, both for providers and for government officials, as well as for families themselves. So really developing the opportunity for those uh, for, for them to, to, to have access to those, um, those kinds of services. Um, I think the the uh, what they're letting families know what they're eligible for that if they if they get free food if they get tested if they get um, um, any any of those kinds of services um, they will not it will not affect their their status or their application um, so that's one one example. Great, thank you, BB and Minerva. Please weigh in on this. Gosh, this was a difficult decision. They have mentioned so many wonderful things. Now it's hard. But uh, one of the things that my boss is right here in this group, and he mentioned the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework, and I had the chance to be a national trainer, and I am still participating with the Alliance in their work. And one of them was translating the work into Spanish. And the reason why I, I was interested in translating the work into Spanish is because when we talk about building protective factors, and addressing this need in the, in the language they speak makes a huge difference. So one of the things that we do and that I implement in my work as family engagement here in West Valley is I embed the protective factors framework in everything we do. So one of the ba basic things, and I think that Manny is, uh, just mentioned that, is building uh, trustful connections with our families, understanding their background, understanding where they come from, and understanding their needs. And one of the best ways to understand their needs is by asking them. A lot of the times we create these wonderful programs and systems and everything, and we say, oh, I think this is what they need. No, maybe that's not what they need. We need to listen. What are their needs? And one of the ways we do that is also through community cafes. And so I have a community cafe at the end of the school year, and I hear from them and I have them talk and they are exchanging ideas and then we harvest and we get all the general ideas they get. And then they help me put them in priority. Okay, what is for you number one priority of all the, the things that you mentioned? And if we think about the cultural responsive teaching on the brain by Hammond, she says it's really important to understand that the brain, it's a social thing. We cannot, and right now during COVID times, we can see the struggle of not connecting physically with others. Yes, uh, Zooms are wonderful, right? But we miss that personal connection with others and that is affecting the brain. So when we're thinking about students that come to a district and they come from different countries or other places and they don't have that sense of belonging and like Brené Brown describes belonging, belonging doesn't mean to fit in. Because if we fit in, that means we have to change who we are and what we are in order to be accepted. But if we really have that true sense of belonging, that means that they are, they are receiving us with everything we come uh, with, our language, our culture, our traditions, all of the things that we are. So it's important to respect culture. And we don't need to know it all. Let's just connect with them. Uh, maybe a home visit is the best way to build connections with that family. I will always remember that time when I had to conduct a home visit. Uh, of course, that was before COVID. But I said, um, I went to that home visit and the family was, you know, kind of like um, not really open for connections because she had received a lot of calls from school. 
So when I go to that home, mom was making tortillas. Good for me, me Mexican. They're making tortillas. I said, you who? And so she opens the door and I go, oh my God, are you making tortillas? And she smiles. Yes. Why? Oh, I love tortillas, but I don't know how to make tortillas. So we started talking about tortillas. And for 20 minutes, we just talked about her ability to make those wonderful tortillas. She felt connected. We built connection. We had a bond right there. At the end of the school year, we had a 504 plan for the student, which is what she needed, but she was not ready to receive. So culture, it's important. It's important to build connections. It's important to respect culture. It's important to respect all of our families with all the baggage and all the information they have. And let's just remember that everything and all the information we're receiving in the environment, our brain is receiving it. And so, um, but that is a different conversation, but let's talk about implicit biases and the way we respond to our families. Sometimes we respond in a negative way because our implicit biases are reacting. And so remember, react is not the same as respond. And when we react, we are building these connections. But well, that's a little bit of what I do. Thank you so many great points that you all shared. Let's go on to our second topic. So we know the importance of establishing learning environments and instructional practices that promote student engagement and voice. And for young children, we know that this means learning through play. So let's talk a little bit about connecting play and learns to your families and specifically how you're addressing this in a culturally responsive way and maybe share some insight in how you're doing this in a virtual world. Manny, do you wanna share? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, connecting families to play and learn. You know, the connections are really strong in Monoma County because we have so many um, partnerships with our Sun Service Systems and with our community organizations. So. You know, families talk to each other and refer to each other to play and learn and programs and all of our partners, our biggest partners, our Multnomah County Libraries and our student health centers um, really help um, to connect in daycares and our child care system really um, supports and helps to connect families to our school based play and learns that we have. Um, within our 10 um, schools. And they're school-based for families who have children ages um, zero to five. So our P3 coordinators, coordinators they host um, playing learn, group, play learn groups twice a week. One that is like mainstream and open to anyone and one that is culturally specific to the demographics of their school community that they're serving. And so we have, you know, I'm all named some, we have Bhutanese, Nepali, Vietnamese, Russian, Slavic, um, African American, um, African Spanish, uh, many, many culturally specific uh, play and learn groups. And um, the, the way that we responsibly hold these play and learn groups is um, we kind of adopted a curriculum called the Kaleidoscope Curriculum that has been established um, up there in Seattle, Washington. And this curriculum is very friendly to, you know, childcare providers, our family, friends, and neighbors. Um, in terms of supporting our families and helping them develop um, skills to get their children school ready and really enhance um, their child development. And the, the Kaleidoscope curricul curriculum is very flexible and friendly in that not only does it provide parent education and topics and materials in specific languages to our families, but what it does, it, it allows our P3 coordinator, coordinators to really have the flexibility to kind of take and 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 kind of, you know, be creative in, in the materials and the activities that they want to represent um, and work with, you know, with their families. Um, most important, it really allows the parents who are engaged in these activities to be the leaders, to be the leaders in their play and learn groups. Um, we're wanting to elevate parent voices at all times. It really, um, helps uh, families to stay connected and really participate in these groups because uh, we are allowing parents to be a part of planning of activities and leading activities such as you know music and movement so, you know songs um, reading books in their own specific 
uh, languages. And it's been really amazing. And even like hosting and leading arts and crafts projects that are relevant to their culture. And so this is really important um, within these plain learning groups to be really flexible, responsive, and really listen and ele elevate our parents' voices when it comes to engagement. Um, and that's kind of like one way, one way that that we're doing that. Um, yeah, and it's and it's worked out worked out really well. And within these plain learning groups, you automatically set up family leadership. So you end up having a parent leadership uh, group and team within your school community that is culturally specific or multicultural. And um, it's it's been a really important piece in the P3 schools that we have in the county. Thank you, that's a great example. Uh, Bibi, what about you? So I'll, um, I'll use an example of something I developed many, many years ago at the organization at Centronia, which is the organization that I founded and, um, and worked in for, for, for many years. Um, it, which is a bilingual, a bilingual organization, English and Spanish serving the, the Latino and African American community. Um, we started something called uh, the family book clubs. Uh, and our family book clubs basically were a way to extend to families whose children may not be enrolled in our child development center. It was really geared towards our, uh, our immigrant community. We have a very large African and Latino um, um, immigrant communities in, the, in, that, in that area. And what, what the book clubs were, were basically bringing 12 families together. We developed a curriculum. Um, I think it was a 12 week curriculum, I believe it is. Uh, it, it continues and it, and it has evolved tremendously. Um, during the, um, the 12 weeks, they meet once a week um, and uh, follow this curriculum. There is a coach and the coach is usually a parent that's been trained to become a coach. Um, these book clubs are held in the fire station and a police station and a library in the basement of a church. So they're not uh, program specific in terms of the organization. Um, it was a way to really develop some of that, as Manny said, some of that parent leadership, because obviously you come out of being 12 weeks in a, in a um, play in a in a book club with your with your child, and you may be interested in then helping other parents lead those book clubs. The the coach received a uh, hundred books that she or he could distribute in his and her own community, giving people giving many of our parents an opportunity to play leadership roles within their community, not just within an organization. Um, and it really brought people out who may have been really socially isolated. Um, and I have tons of stories of, of women that I met over this period of time who um, had no idea how to begin to connect to the community that they were living in. Um, and this, the situation for many of our, of our immigrant families are so different. Um, and and uh, culturally, there's so, there, there are lots of cultural differences. And in many of them, we found that the role of women and women being able to get out of the home to do, um, to sort of, participate outside of the of the home or the family structure sometimes is limited. And so creating opportunities that are non-threatening, that bring a value to the family are always um, very, very positive. And, and like I said, I have tons of stories of folks who started as family book club members and ended up as uh, pre-K teachers or early childhood teachers in their community. And that's what's really powerful about, um, again, something that is very much parent-led and community-led. Yes, very powerful and inspiring. Um, BB, do you see that as an idea that people could incorporate that idea virtually? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that, that we are finding in the work that I'm doing in Montgomery County, Maryland, I keep saying that because Manny and I are not in the same Montgomery County, um, is that uh, parent, because it, it doesn't require people traveling, I mean, I know that they miss the, the physical connection of being together in a, in a social environment, but we're finding that more parents participate uh, on the virtual, um, uh, for example, in parent meetings and parent um, uh, orientations, there seems to be greater participation um, uh, as we're trying to reopen schools and reopen child development centers in, in our area. Um, so I think it's very doable. Um, it requires just a little bit of, of sophistication from the 
leadership part and from the coaches to help them really understand how to do that. But children are so attuned to the technology that it's really more about the adults being able to be attuned to the technology. Um, so that I, I think I think it, in, a, in a COVID moment, we've had to really pivot a lot of the things that we've done. Um, the, the, the other piece, and maybe I, I'll leave that for another, for another one of the questions, was our family involvement centers around the county um, that have been really, really successful, but I can talk about those later. Great. Minerva, what about you in relation to Play and Learns? Well, this is an interesting question, uh, Gracie, because here in Yakima, we have so many different groups, so many different Play and Learn groups in, in the city, the county, I think. Um, and here in West Valley, we before COVID, we were conducting two of them. And uh, the interesting part about Play and Learn, kale Kaleidoscope Play and Learn, is that they are based on the Strengthening Families Protective Factor Framework. So they do consider the social emotional competence of children. They consider the parental resilience, concrete supporting times of need, uh, social connections is one of the most important components. And um, so we, in the play and learn classes or sessions, we want families to feel welcome. And the way we think about culture when we're uh, in regards to play and learn sessions is we integrate um, cultural themes or probably um, cultural displays or toys. We had a station, I, one of my favorite stations was instruments and we had little instruments for children to play with and they were from different cultures, you know? So I had a little uh, rattle thing that would make cute noise and it was from Peru, it was beautiful. Uh, or little rattles that are made of hay from Mexico or different things that everybody can learn from. And that's a good way to build connections and always uh, understand that maybe the way we need to build connections with people coming from different countries is going to be um, one of the things we need to um, bear in mind and be more open for that diversity that they bring and culture and richness they bring to the group. But yeah, we do have a lot of play and learn groups here in Yakima. Thank you. And Joe. Absolutely. Um, from the just building perspective, um, it's great to hear all the other things in the community and um, things as well. But at the building, I think um, the thing that we talk about a lot is just making sure before we even uh, kind of talk about play and learn is just making sure the building is welcoming um, and friendly, not just to students who uh, traditionally have gone to this building, a kindergartner uh, or you know third grader, for example, but making sure that um, a family with an infant when they come into the building feels comfortable and welcome and that they're not disturbing um, the environment by any means. So that's something we really think about a lot just in terms of when they're entering the building, um, what type of experience are they getting so that if they come to um, a play and learn group that they'll come again. Um, and I think we've talked about this a little, but I think that's so important is getting our families connected to our school prior to them coming to school and preschool and kindergarten. Um, so we really try to offer as many things to our um, one and two year olds as we offer to students who are in school here. And obviously that has um, some barriers to it that we're constantly looking at and trying to identify. Um, but that's something really important when we're looking at these play and learns. Um, we host uh, play and learns here at the building uh, pre COVID time, we would do that in person. Uh, we hold those in our media center and we have a nice dedicated area that's uh, very friendly, very uh, bright and welcoming. Um, and our families who are participating in our home visiting program uh, come and uh, learn along with their child. And I think this has been brought up a lot um, and it's really important is the parent is really encouraged to be the one leading that um, they're not just coming to get um, and they're not coming to just sit they're really getting down on the carpet with um, their child and interacting and the uh, home visitor and family facilitator are kind of facilitating on the side um, and really providing that encouragement and providing confidence to those families to keep doing the great things that they're that they're doing um, along with that so that's really uh, targeted more for our families that are in our home visiting program um, and so that's a select um, group that we've kind of identified we also offer story times just for anybody in our community and 
we allow those kids to check out books. Um, I think it's, uh, we kind of see school as reserved for just when you come to school and, and it sits here and we've got all these great resources um, that aren't utilized all the time by those that are in our community that will be going here. So we try to find ways uh, to include them as early on. So checking out books, reading stories to them. And again, the focus on that is to um, help the parents build their confidence uh, to be able to take that back with them when they leave. Um, and then finally, just, you know, in the home visits, um, that's um, really the big focus when they're in there is making sure that the parents are using every opportunity um, to learn and work with their child. And just, again, reinforcing that um, they can do it um, and it's okay to be silly. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to be on the uh, floor and doing those things. Um, and just kind of giving them that confidence to do it. So lots of really uh, fun opportunities here um, to incorporate play. Thank you, Joe. And I could see that in our uh, Q&A box that there were some questions that were populating for this topic. And I just wanted to reassure everybody that we are trying to uh, leave some time at the end so that we can go through some of the, the questions for you all. So let's go to our, our third topic. So we know that families are young children's first and most important teachers. And we know that consistently research supports the positive impacts that family engagement and meaningful homeschool relationships have on student achievement. So talk a little bit about what your overall approach to family outreach is not just deepening family engagement, but truly trying to achieve that family partnership. It's kind of like moving beyond just engaging parents, but that partnership with families, um, especially as we've talked about while you've been working with your culturally specific groups. So uh, Minerva, let's start with you. Oh, that sounds great. Oh, so I will continue talking about the protective factors framework. And I just embed that framework into the work that I do. I honor, uh, we honor and respect culture. We uh, honor and respect funds of knowledge and use that also as a starting point. And we like to make a huge emphasis on our families to let them know that they have the power. So instead of using this word of um, empowerment, that gives the idea that they don't have the power and that's not true, they do have the power. So just help them feel uh, or build that self-efficacy competences, they need to advocate for themselves. And um, there is one statement that when I read that, I, I, it caught my eye real big because they say that culturally linguistically students feel they are in disadvantage and they say, I can't do that because I don't have the language. I can't do that because I don't have the same thing. So we have to change that mindset and let them know they can do it. We have to promote that growth mindset. You cannot do that yet, but you will. So promote that growth mindset is really important. Thank you. What about you, Joe, moving from just engaging parents to really having those meaningful partnerships? Yeah, I think uh, Minerva hit on a big thing that we're um, working on is just um, encouraging them to be uh, advocates and finding reasons, reducing those barriers that prevent that. Um, as I kind of spoke about before, when we're not getting feedback, um, not putting that on the families and saying they're not participating, but really reflecting ourselves of, we're not asking the right questions or we're not doing it in the right way. Um, and so being reflective um, internally before kind of going out um, and putting that on the, on the family. So I think that's a huge thing Thing is uh, really helping our families to um, see that we not only say that Sandoz belongs to all families, but that's really what we do and that's really um, what we show. Um, and that definitely takes it to another level and something that we're kind of constantly working on. Um, you know, beyond just the, you know, the basics of being visible um, and things, our family facilitator, um, does a wonderful job of supporting as a liaison and helping our families become advocates for themselves. 
Um, lots of times they'll bring concerns to her um, and she does a really nice job of listening to their concern, but then helping them uh, to bring that concern to me or to the teacher. Um, and I, what they see um, or what I hope they see when that happens is that they have a lot to bring um, and their experiences are valuable and we value them. Um, it's just, you know, making sure they see that our ears are open. And so we need to do a better job of showing that our ears are open. Uh, so being visible, the, you know, like I mentioned before, the coffee and juice and things like that, just doing things that kind of makes us maybe a little more approachable um, than sitting behind a desk or something like that. We also are just looking for ways to reduce barriers on ways for families to get involved. Lots of times, Families want to be partners, um, but there's uh, different barriers that we're putting up. And so things like offering babysitting um, when we have a, you know, a parent night or something like that gives them um, an opportunity to attend and maybe they wouldn't have been able to uh, attend those. So just kind of trying to constantly think about um, and ask, um, we've talked about that too, what are those barriers and try to eliminate as many of those as we need. Um, and then finally, I think, one thing that we're really working on is connecting our families um, to each other, finding authentic ways for them to uh, develop a community within our school um, and just strengthen that entire school community. And so, um, you know, COVID has provided challenges for that, but I think in some ways, um, like people have mentioned in the comments, we've really seen um, an increase in participation in a lot of things because some of the barriers are reduced, certainly not all of them, um, but it's really been nice to see our families rely on each other um, and kind of go through this experience and have somebody to support them. And with that, we just have a better opportunity that they're going to bring those ideas that they have to us. And so we can in turn um, adapt the things that we're doing to better meet all of their needs. Great, thank you. And BB? So, um, I, I wanna touch on something that Joe said and, and, and sort of build on that because he, he uh, and, and, and I think something that uh, that Minerva said earlier on um, this idea of, of reflective um, some of some of the self-reflection that needs to happen I think that um, we had, we do a real disservice to our community as a whole our teaching community our school community as well as uh, overall if we don't pay attention to um, training and, and providing opportunities for our staff to really learn about families and about their values, their culture, their, um, to, to deal with our implicit biases um, and to understand those. Uh, we're asking teachers uh, often to have three children from three, four, five different backgrounds uh, in their classroom and, and parent-teacher conferences with parents um, uh, and home visits with families um, from many different backgrounds. I think it's really important that we provide teachers with the tools that they themselves then can, can really uh, use in the classroom and in any of their activities with families. Um, so I think that, that in order to have really strong family partnerships, I think we need to make sure that those of us who are uh, in positions of authority and power and, and, um, and understand sort of the cultural perspective for that, that folks bring to a school or to a uh, formal institution from their own cultures um, and, and sort of how they perceive those organizations and, and, and making sure that, that our, um, uh, our professional staff understand those and are well, um, are well uh, have the training and the opportunity to learn about that. I, there are um, a couple of models that, that um, have been spoken about that I think are really um, I, I have found in the work that I've done over the years really helpful. One is the parent cafes. I think the parent cafes have done uh, are, are really an amazing model in terms of really providing an open-ended environment uh, for parents to come to the table with what their particular needs are, not our perspective of what it is that they need, I think, as has been said. Um, I think the other, the other that some of you may be familiar with, but if you're not, I, I, would, I would urge you to look up what Flamboyant does. The, the Flamboyant Foundation um, has done just an amazing job helping teachers uh, cre create those linkages with parents by uh, walking through a home visiting program, um, especially at the beginning of the school year. I've heard from many teachers how incredibly valuable that is, both in child development centers as well as 
as in K-12 uh, in K-12 settings. So that I think has been, uh, we have in, in, in Maryland, we have Judy centers that really bring together the early Head Start and uh, um, early, uh, early Head Start eligible parents, as well as other parents, as well as, as our families who may be receiving uh, services through uh, our infant toddler program. And so those are, those are all models that I think are really worth it, that folks can really uh, look at and, and replicate as, as needed. Our, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about our family involvement centers. Uh, these are sort of one classroom. We've embedded them in a school. We've embedded them in, in, uh, in government facilities where parents can come sign up and come on a regular basis uh, to uh, have these play and learn types of, 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 of experiences. Uh, to maybe meet with the specialist because their child is receiving special services when they may not be able to receive them at home because of overcrowding or, or for whatever number of reasons. So also providing the kinds of spaces where those, those activities can happen um, when the homes are not, uh, uh, when, when, some, when families don't feel comfortable having them come to their home for, for whatever number of reasons. Um, I think we always have to be really conscious, and I, I know I've said this, but I repeat it every time I, I speak anywhere, is we've got to be really conscious about the, um, the level of fear that has been embed embedded in our communities, over, especially over the last few years, um, around accessing anybody, anything that looks like it's government or formal institutions and their, their ability to uh, feel safe around that. That's a great point. Manny, did you have anything else to add? Sure. I just want to say, you know, here in Multnomah County within our Sun service system and P3, we really focus on like three main approaches. And the first one is our, our strength-based approach. And, and that is, is what that is about is that that is meeting where families are at. Um, that is uh, elevating and working on the strengths and the skills that our families already have. And what that also means is, um, you know, listening to our families and our parents and allowing our families to be the experts in their own lives, really key to the services that we um, try to provide to our families. And then the other approach that we um, strive for is to be trauma, trauma informed. Um, historically, you know, tra historical trauma, um, being informed of uh, traumas that our communities have faced or may be facing, um, whether it's community or individual. And the other approach that we want to strive for is kind of like a holistic approach. Um, within our Sun service systems, we really focus on wraparound services. We really try to do our best to support our families, um, not just physically, but mentally, uh, spiritually, and social emotionally. Um, and, and, and most important, um, relationship building is huge for us. Um, in our approach. And, um, you know, we have a school district here in uh, Multnomah County, our biggest school district, Portland Public Schools, who is doing an amazing job in um, reevaluating um, the early learning programs and, and trying to uh, build better bridges and working on gaps of transitioning, you know, our early learning um, families pre-K to Head Start to um, our main schools by, by looking at biases, working on their own biases um, and definitely focusing on equity work and minimizing barriers. So we're really uh, fortunate and lucky to have uh, ama amazing leadership in particular school districts in our county um, that really, really support um, the approaches that we try to strive for in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know that we wanna leave some time for questions. So we're going to go uh, past the next slide, if you want to go to our question slide. And I know that we have uh, had help from New America, who's helping us with our tech today, collect some questions in our Google Forms. So can you all help me with some of the questions that have been asked today to our panelists? I know that I saw one in particular, and someone asked in relation to the play and learns, and I think this was addressed to you, Manny, 
but could you talk a little bit about how you select parents um, to go into those leadership positions? Um, absolutely. It's not so much a, a, a selection. It's um, just trying to embrace all the parents that we have uh, attending and kind of picking up on um, where they're at and how excited they are and, and if they're ready to do to do those things and just to give everyone equal opportunity. So you'll have parents who are ready. So we're watching and we're listening and we definitely throughout time know, know who those parents are and they themselves um, volunteer, you know, and step up and it's open to anyone and everyone. But within their, but within their own school-based communities, a lot of our son schools have particular set family leadership teams um, and then that can be um, cultivated and, 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 and include some of our P3 parents, you know, the parents that don't have their schools registered yet, but yet I do know out there in our school communities that a lot of these P3 parents are already participating in the bigger family leadership teams that are there at their main school. And that is very exciting. And I, I do have to mention this, that there has been at least three, um, P3 coordinator who are three folks who are P3 coordinators now who have been P3 parents. And that's kind of like what we strive for, you know, we just keep on elevating them and they're, they're the participants and then now they're, they're the coordinators. So yeah, it's not, it's not a mad, matter of ABC, you're it. It's, um, it's building relationships and just listening and watching. Thanks. Thank you, Manny. Um, I know another question that came in through our Q&A is how do you give parents the skills um, to be more welcoming to families of other cultures? I think you've got to, you have to, it's a tough question because because they're they're really often um, some um, and I go back to the fact that there are folks who don't even realize that they're not being welcoming right that they, there is such uh, sort of in, uh, embedded or implicit bias and and um, and there's also fear right and there are um, there are certainly notions of um, lack of language being lack of culture or lack of understanding or lack of knowledge. Um, and, you know, for those of us who are immigrants to this country, who um, uh, did not speak the language when we came, who our parents didn't speak the language when we came, uh, it is, um, it really does take a, a tremendous amount of work and it has to be very explicit. Um, you can't sort of walk around it. You've got to be very explicit and you have to do some of the things that are uncomfortable. Uh, translating your, your meetings. Um, uh, putting, uh, making sure that there's equity around leadership, uh, ensuring that that um, more and more of the work that you do is bilingual, trilingual, in in, in whatever way. Um, it's not just about asking the Latino parents to bring them food on the food days, right? Because we do that really well. Latinos do that really well. We'll we'll make the 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 food. It is really much more about um, a. a about being very explicit to families and to to the rest of the community, the, the the rest of the parent community, that um, uh, these children, these families have the same level of rights and the same level of, of and and that they have. I think it was either Manny or Minerva who talked about the um, the the level of of skills and understanding and knowledge base that many of our families bring if we just give them a chance. Uh, if we just open up the, the, the space for that, there are, um, there are often many of our families who have incredible experience in their own backgrounds and in their own work, but that because they don't speak the language, that experience doesn't come through in terms of being able to be assets to that community and, to that, and, and real assets to that learning community beyond making food. <laughs> hey, Gracie, I would like to add to what Bibi just said and uh... I loved all what she just said, everything, every single piece she said, because it's so important to honor our families and to help them feel welcome. 
So that is one step, but we also have to create this awareness on our staff, right? Uh, and if they are, if, if there is not self-awareness, I cannot see what I'm doing. So that's another part that we need to do with our school staff and, uh, and ourselves, right? Because we might be responding or reacting to certain groups of people in the not engaging way. So we have to see what we're doing. We, there has to be a lot of self-assessments and create these growth, personal growth to build better connections and more meaningful connections. But BB hit the nail right there. I think um, I, yeah, I totally agree. I, um, I think making sure that, as I mentioned before, that the leadership groups that I have are representative of the different culture groups in our school, I think goes a long way in showing not only them that I value the experiences beyond like BB was saying, just bringing food uh, to to participate in a culture night or something like that, which is great. But I think it shows the rest of our community um, that there's a lot of experiences um, that we need to kind of work together on. Um, and I saw that question in the chat for me about how we measure those family perceptions. Um, and I think to me, that's what I'm looking for by building teams that are diverse. Um, I have to get to know our families very intimately to get the type of um, tough feedback that I need to hear to make long lasting changes. Um, I think we can send out surveys, uh, we can reflect um, as teams, but unless I develop really deep relationships with all members of our community, I'm not, I'm going to be missing um, a massive um, Part, part of knowledge and experiences that I really need to know. And so that's my goal is to make those teams more representative just so that they feel valued um, and that everybody else sees that as well. I would like to add one more thing if you don't mind. And, and that is the great support that I have for from my superintendent. Assistant Superintendent Peter Finch has been key and uh, Superintendent Mike Brophy has also been really supportive. And uh, he shows up every month to a meeting with our Hispanic families. And our families ask questions to him and he's there to listen. That was before COVID and even in school closures. We meet via Zoom with our families on a monthly basis and they have shared with them, thank you, thank you, Dr. Brophy. I'm not invis invis invisible anymore. You are, you are looking at me. And that always brings uh, tears to my eyes because I hate to think of families feeling invisible. So the superintendent uh, has been there every month to listen. And then the day after, if there are some requests or suggestions, the day after he's taking care of business right there. So that is, I, I feel lucky. Thank you for adding that um, support. When we feel supported, that just um, means the world, I know, to everyone. And it's such an important thing to uh, be able to have that feeling. And I know that's what we're trying to give the families in our school and community, that they are heard. I heard that a lot today, giving a lot of informal ways for families to be heard and to kind of share their stories and not us guessing at what they need, but really listening to them so that we're very purposeful as we respond to those needs. So um, going back to kind of a topic that we skipped to get to some other questions, I wanted to ask, um, we, we all know the challenges of COVID-19, and I think that uh, BB put it very uh, eloquently when she said that we have really had to pivot this year in a lot of ways. But if you could pull out something that is a positive in partnering with families, um, People talked a little bit about seeing more families participate virtually, but if you could pull out a few more positives that have resulted from, from our interactions or our dealing with COVID, what would that be? I'm just gonna open that up to anybody on the panel. 
I, I would say, oh, I don't have to go ahead. Oh, sorry. I don't have anything proven on this, but I, I, I do really think that the opportunity for those parents who can be at home with their children while they're virtually, uh, um, where they're getting school virtually, that's still happening in many jurisdictions across the country. Um, they, they're they getting a much, if they have time and are able to get to, to sort of more closely watch what's happening in school for their kids, uh, it may be introducing parents in some way to school curriculum and school, um, even school culture and, and much more opportunity to at least see the teachers, uh, which is not something that many of our parents get a lot of chance to do, especially if they're working two jobs and they can't get to PTA or they can't get to parent teacher meetings and so on. So I think that maybe, I mean, I don't think, I don't know if anybody's measured that yet, but I think that there may be some of that. Um, but, you know, you wanted the positive, so I'll, I'll stop there because I have a lot of negative. <laughs> Well, I want to add some positives, and that is when we think about a, an event, right, we always look at the challenges, and we think about childcare, who's going to be watching the kids while we are providing this information to families. Well, we don't have that challenge right there. When we're having virtual meetings with families, um, I'm telling you, we have families sometimes making dinner or folding clothes at the same time that they are in, in a meeting, and that is wonderful for me. So before COVID, I would probably say, oh, I had a good information meeting. Uh, I had 10 parents. Oh, wow, excellent. Well, now if I have 10 parents, that means that probably not everybody showed up. You know what I'm saying? So we have more and better engagement, definitely, virtually, because they can be at home. Sometimes even our ELL classes for adults, you see them driving, and I tell them, hey, your eyes on the road, okay? But if you know the answer, you can shout out and mute yourself and give me the answer. But something, I mean, the engagement has been wonderful. And yeah, we miss the physical, you know, being in, in a room with the people, but let's look at what's positive out of the whole thing. Otherwise, our mental health is gonna pay the price. Let's look at all the strengths that we have and bring to the table despite the pandemic. What about you, Joe? Yeah, I think what I, I think it's exactly what BB was kind of talking about is just opening up our schools to our families in such a new way. I've talked to our teachers a lot. Um, we kind of have a captive audience right now in our teachers. We are in our parents, excuse me. Um, they're looking for us as they're supporting their child and learning at home um, as kind of the experts. How are they supposed to support their child at home? And so we oftentimes, you know, uh, get frustrated that parents aren't supporting them with reading or math, but we stop there and we don't show them how, we don't show them what that looks like. Um, and with this experience, we really can, um, and we always should, but we really can open up that classroom um, in a new way that that they can be a little more, um, you know, knowledgeable about what their child's experience looks like on a day in and day out basis. Um, so our families, I think, are recognizing um, the need to look to us, and I really talking to our teachers uh, and staff about really capitalizing on this moment to strengthen that partnership um, that we've worked worked hard to build all along, but we're really relying on it really hard right now. Thank you. So are your, are your teachers um, coming back to you with the insights that they're getting from getting to see the homes? Uh, in some cases, there are multiple people in a very small space um, that they may have not realized. Are you, are you, is, is it, is it reciprocal? Is it, by, uh, is, is it happening for your teachers also? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think um, having a better awareness of uh, maybe some of the obstacles and barriers um, that they are overcoming each day to show up to the Zoom um, on time and things like that. And I think we're just uh, being all, we're all more adaptive to the ways in which we're meeting the needs. So um, yeah, there, you know, there are a million negatives uh, that we could go on and on, but that certainly is a positive that I've seen come out of it is um, some of our families families that just maybe didn't know a way to get connected. This kind of uh, forced it upon all of us. Um, and they've really taken advantage of that. Uh, and so I've been really pleased with 
um, the commitment, and it hasn't been easy that they've shown throughout this. I know that I've had principals share that have schools that maybe are doing morning meetings that parents are invited to the morning meetings and have become a part of that and school assemblies. So again, parents who may not have been able to participate in some events before now have the opportunity to do that virtually. So um, any last advice before we go on to our last two slides, best advice to leave our participants with today? I just, I just wanted to uh, mention just a really quick one positive um, about this time is just the deeper connections that our school staff and our son staff are having with families. Um, a lot of families right now during COVID are in, are in crisis, but being able to make those personal phone calls for wellness checks and making sure that they're, they're okay before they even show up for a, a Zoom play and learn or you know, short snippets of play and learn here and there um, has been um, really key, really key um, during this time. And uh, one, one thing I do want to share about Play and Learn that I did not um, mention was uh, another way of how we are responsive in, is that, yes, the majority of time it is school-based, but for our culturally specific families, the communities are new to them. And so we really want to support and broaden their experiences. So our Play and Learn groups are, are hosted in many, many variety of settings. Our, our community uh, rec centers, our parks, our pools, um, you know, out in the zoo. And so it's, it's just a really unique way to get them out there in the community and see the resources they have, but, um, but also to just to be, to be flexible and just broaden more of their experiences out there. And, and to be able to do that through Play and Learn is, is, is a great way, a great way to be, uh, uh, more flexible and responsive to their needs. And they're really excited about that. It's almost like a field trip for them. We get to go to the zoo and do play and learn there, right? Um, I wanted to respond to Erin's question around um, the, the connection between schools and community um, organizations. And in particular, in this moment, a lot of local governments and states are funneling resources and dollars to their community-based organizations for the primary needs that parents have. And so um, I would urge principals to, um, uh, and, and, and folks within the schools is to um, look around their community for those community-based organizations that have those resources, whether it's diaper deliveries, or, uh, because boy, diapers have been such a huge issue, diapers and food and, um, and mental health and, 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 and primary language resources. Um, I think there are a lot of community-based organizations that are available and are um, have really stepped up their game and they've gotten local funding to do some of that. And so uh, I do think there is a, there's a lot of opportunity for those partnerships to happen. Thank you. And we're gonna go to our last uh, slide. I just wanna remind our participants that next week we will have the fourth and final webinar in this series, Lead Strategically and Continuously Improve. So please tune in next Thursday, December 10th at four Eastern time. And then our last slide is just a big thank you for all of our panelists tonight. Thank you for being here your commitment to develop and foster ongoing lasting partnerships with families and their communities is evident. And we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today.